over here it wouldn't take very long. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, this was all top secret, and the president just disappeared for four days. You know, there was no television, no radio, no smartphones, no Facebook. Presidents could get away with a lot more than they can get away with today. So for four days, he gets on this yacht, goes up to New York Harbor, floats up and down the coast. And while he's there, they do this surgery. They laid him down and they rub the top of the roof of his mouth with cocaine. And his whole head, I assume, went dead. Uh, and then they cut that out. Now, you just imagine that. Somebody splitting that palate of yours that's bone, sawing that in two and prying your teeth out. And the whole time they had made this rubber jaw over there. And when they put it in, it didn't fit. So they had to take it back out with the president laying there. I don't know if he was conscious or not. I don't know if they just deadened it, but lying there. And they had to reshape it, and they had to do that a couple of times. And finally, they get it in. And a couple of days later, they say, well, how are you doing, Mr. President? And he couldn't talk, okay? He couldn't talk. He had to adjust to that. So for several weeks, they just keep him, you know, the press doesn't have access. But again, this is before all of this technological stuff that we have today. Presidents could get away with a lot more than they can get away with today. Uh, for a long time after, Grover Cleveland had trouble pronouncing words, okay? So he's pretty much a sheltered president in his second and last term as president, okay? The surgery, by the way, took 90 minutes. It took him 90 minutes to split his palate and pull it out, okay? Pretty effective. Anyway... So by the election of 1896, let's go to that. By the election of 1896, then, Grover, the Depression was still going on, and Grover Cleveland was the most hated man in America. He was blamed for starting the Depression. His own party didn't want him. His own, you know, the Democrats are sort of going through that today. You know, they're debating right now whether or not Joe Biden ought to be their candidate in 2024. Right now, the polls show, and I've been saying this, but the polls show that if we have another matchup between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Joe, and it's pretty early, but still, Joe, uh, Donald Trump is leading. He would, I think it's 48 to 44 uh, percent or something like 42 percent, maybe. Anyway, uh, Trump is substantially ahead. And the Democrats are debating, well, is this Biden too old? Should we get rid uh and, and nominate someone new. Well, that's what the Democrats were going through in 1896. You know, Cleveland was so unpopular, a good number of Democrats said, we can't nominate him again. Uh, so the Democrat Party, get this down, going into this election is divided. They're split. And that's one of the reasons they're going to lose. When a party is divided, that greatly reduces its chances of winning. And so there are two issues in this election. Number one, what is the number one issue? What are people looking for someone to do? Help what? That's too general. What do they want? What's going on? What's the biggest thing going on in the country? The There's the depression. So what if what if, what do people want? They want to elect someone who will do what? In the depression. Yes. Restore jobs. Put people back to work. Yes. This is not rocket science here. In the depression. And then what's the second great issue of the Gilded Age? Money. Money. Very good. Whether or not we will have what? Gold, Gold coins or silver. silver and paper coins. Those are the two great issues. Well, get this down. Now, this is eight. Now, you got to keep this in your mind. This is 1896. Okay. In 1892, four years before this, the populist had nominated James B. Weaver as their candidate. Uh, and uh, he, of course, had not been elected. He ran a pretty good race, but he had not been elected. Well, since they didn't win in 1892, the Populist Party went away uh, to an extent. They, they migrated to another party, okay? They said, we can't win on our own. So what we've got to do is we've got to take over one of the major parties, and we've got to get the things that we propose into the platform of one of the major parties so we can get those things enacted in the law. And which major party did they join? The Democrat, okay? The Democrat Party. I'm talking about the major two, Democrat and Republicans. The Democrat Party, write that down. You know, the Democrats were a lot friendlier to them than the Republicans would have been. And so the Democrat Party, I want you to write this down. By 1896, the Democrat Party is a fusion party. 
several groups have come together in that party. First of all, you've got the conservative Democrats. Write this down, the conservative Democrats. They're for the gold standard. And who are they supporting for president? How many Democrats from 1896 do you know? I mean, the Cleveland, that's exactly right. Because Cleveland, if you remember what I told you about the election of 1892, Cleveland is a conservative gold bug Democrat. So you've got these people who want the gold standard and they really want nothing to change. They say everything's okay. And then you have the populists who've joined the party, the populists, okay? It's sort of like in 2016, the MAGA people, the Trump people took over the Republican Party. There were people, including Donald Trump, who had never been a Republican, and all of a sudden they became Republicans. And now they dominate the Republican Party. People like old line Republicans like me don't like that, but regardless of what we like or dislike, that's a fact. Well, the populists are going to do the same thing in 1896. They're going to take over, to a degree, the, the Democrat Party and they're liberal. So you've got this war going on between these old line, old conservative Democrats and new populist liberal Democrats, okay? And the party that year, get this down, you know, met in Chicago. That's where their convention was. And for a whole week, they fought back and forth. Who's going to be the nominee of the party? Liberals versus conservatives, people who wanted to keep things like they were with the gold standard and people who stood for great change, not just silver, but a graduated income tax, an end to monopolies and all those things we've talked about that the populace stood for. And the party's fighting back and forth. A conservative speaker would get up. And by the way, they're in a place called the Wigwam. It's a big auditorium. They, and in those days, they had no artificial speaking devices. But the way that building was built, engineering, acoustics, the way that building was built, everybody in that room could hear the speakers. You had to speak sort of loudly, but you could be heard in all parts of that room. It's an amazing thing. You know, when I was at college and you were in one of those large classes, the professor would wear a little microphone on his tie or on his shirt, and every time he moved or raised his arms, you'd hear now today, you know what they're building? They don't have those. They're built. They're doing. They're doing what the ancient Greeks did 2,500 years ago. They're building those buildings, acoustics, and you can stand down on the platform or down in the front of the class. Well, you'll sit when you go to school, and 300 people will be there, and they'll speak about what well, like I was speaking right now, and everybody in that room will hear what they're saying without a microphone. Well, that's the way they used to build buildings. I take students over to Pompeii. And there's a great uh, Roman uh, theater there that they say could seat 20,000 people. To, and it's out in the open. It's in, in open air. Uh, it looks like this. If you ever in Pompeii, you'll see it. The stage is down here. And this is just cut into the side of a hill. And the seats are like this. <laughs> and when I'm there, I'll tell the students... You know, you can walk all over and have people crawling all over. I'll tell the students, <clears throat> go up to the top, and they'll all go up there and stand. And then, I'll, and then there are people running back and forth and shouting and making noise and all that. And I'll turn around and I'll put my hand like this, and I'll say, everybody raise your left hand. And I'll turn just about like that. And, there, and I'll turn around, and this is outside, open air. That's the way they go. And every one of them stand there with their left hand up. Okay, it's acoustics. just want to point that out. These people don't have microphones, but they can be heard in every corner of that hall. <coughs> so this debate had gone on every, all week long. And the last speaker in this debate, get this down, was this man right here, a populist Democrat from Nebraska. A populist Democrat from Nebraska. And his name, look at that. Students want to write it like this. I don't know why. It's not Bryant. There is no T. His name is Brian. This guy had so many supporters in Oklahoma. Any of you been to Durant? Which county is Durant in? Brian County, named after him. He had a lot of support in what is today, well, what was then Indian Territory and what is today, Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, Bryan County, one of our 77 counties is named after 
William Jennings Bryan, but spell it right. This is a major figure in American history. You don't misspell his name. By the way, he's also, he was called, but he had followers all over the country. And by the way, get used to him because this guy is going to be with us a long, long time. He's going to run for president three times. He never wins, but the Democrats are going to nominate him three times. And his followers called him, you know, I think the Trump followers are pretty devout people. I may disagree with them, but boy, they are for Trump. Well, his followers were the same way. Uh, they supported him. They wrote his name in on presidential ballots after he was dead. Okay. William Jennings Bryan. And uh, he was sort of the hero of the so-called common people, whatever that is. But he was called, get this down, the great commoner. The great commoner. In other words, the hero of the common people of America. And he was a populist Democrat. He is a liberal. That word we hate in Oklahoma, we think. Uh, and so they chose him to give the final speech. And here these Democrats have fought all week. And Brian is going to stand on that stage alone in front of 15,000 people. And with his great booming voice, uh, he gave a speech called the Cross of Gold. Write that down, the Cross of Gold speech. If you ever hear that, always associate it with William Jennings Bryan. Some historians say it was the greatest, and this is in 1896, some historians say this was the greatest speech given in American history since the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Personally, I don't think it quite measures up to that, but it was a great speech. And I want you to know what he said in that speech, okay? I don't want you to just know he gave the cross. That's how we teach history. We say, well, just remember, it's the great American, uh, you know, it's the, the cross of gold speech. Well, he gave, what did he say? Well, we don't have any idea what he said. We just know he gave the cross of gold speech. That's online education. That's why you come in here and know nothing. Not your fault, but that's why. Well, I want you to know what he said. Get this down in the cross of gold speech. Number one, he attacked the gold standard. It's probably the main thing he said. He said, you know, we, we, we need to coin silver money. He came out for the free and unlimited coinage of silver. But he did more than that. Get this down. He attacked... <coughs> the Industrial Revolution, and modernization. You ever hear people my age say, boy, things are just changing too fast. We can't keep up with all the changes. Well, William Jennings Bryan, and get this down, he's only 36 years old. How old do you have to be to be president of the United States? What does the rule book here say? How old do you have to be? 35. You know, uh, Is Trump double that? Is Joe Biden? Joe Biden's older than Trump. How old, will Donald, how old will Donald Trump be if he's elected in 2024? That's two years. He's 70, 79. He would be 83 years old if he was elected again. How old would Joe Biden be? 84. You know, when are, we, when are you young people going to take over this country? When are we going to get over this idea that we have to have somebody, uh, you know, I don't know, a day older than God to be president of the United States? It's just amazing to me. Uh, the rut we seem to be in, but that appeals to us now. Anyway, anyway, well, this guy was 36. He was barely old enough to be president of the United States, and not very many people knew him. He was a congressman. He served in the House of Representatives from Nebraska, represented some little district in Nebraska, but not very many people knew him. So he attacked modernization and the Industrial Revolution. He said the Industrial, get this down, he said the Industrial Revolution had brought too much change too quick. He said, what did we get out of this industrial revolution? Well, yeah, the country's getting richer. Well, yeah, there are more jobs. Yeah, we're challenging England for supremacy in the world. But there's a dark side to the revolution. It's created slums. The cities are, that it created is, are overcrowded. The workers suffering in sweatshops, underpaid workers, monopolies controlling the country. That's what the industrial revolution has brought about. And he said, there's a solution. And to get this down, he said, there's a solution. You know, you never want to give a speech and just point out the problems. It's all right to point out the problems, but if you're going to get anywhere, you got to show this is how we're going to fix it. I've pointed out the problems. This is how we're going to fix it. Get this down. So he said, we must go back. Now, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with going back? Can you go back to the beginning of this class? 
I don't care how rich, how powerful you are. Can you ever go back? No. By the way, the American people are the most forward-looking people in the world, and that served us pretty well. The American people want to know what tomorrow is going to be. That's why it's hard to teach them history. That's why they don't know their history. If they ever figure out that if they know their history, they know what tomorrow, to a large degree, not entirely, that they know what tomorrow is going to bring, because history is all about, if they ever figure that out, boy, we're going to take off like a Roman candle. But yeah, we're not interested in that. It's 1892. What the heck does that have to do with anything under the shining sun today, right now, and more importantly, tomorrow? Politicians that talk about going back, there's just one problem with that. You can never go back, especially people who say we need to go back to the good old days. What are the good old days, by the way? They're when you're young. They're when you're young. But you know what? If you could, you know, I, I sometimes say, oh, if I could just go back to the 60s, what am the 60s were as full of problems as today. The thing you would find out if it were possible, and it's not, but the thing you would find out if it were possible to go back to the good old days, so-called good old days, you'd find out that those days weren't that good. They just weren't that good. So Brian says, we've got to go back <coughs> to a <coughs> simpler time. We've got to go back to a simpler time. We've got to go back to pre, uh, we've got to go back, excuse me, to pre-Civil War days. We've got to go back to when America was an agrarian. That's a farm, agra agrarian, agriculture. We've got to go back to the good old days when the cities were small, 70% of us lived on farms. How glorious it was. We have to go back. And he also said this, get this down. He said, and he was right about this. He said, agriculture, agriculture is the basis of civilization. Or if you want to put it this way, agriculture created. And that's true. The human race has been on the earth for about a couple of million, <laughs> maybe 3 million years. And for most of the human race's history, they wandered back and forth. They lived in little bands. They were terrified. And then one day, some women and children, you know, the men went out to, I'll throw this story in H.T. Ancient History. The men would go out, you know, you ever watch one of these cavemen movies? You know, the men are running around in skins and they take a little stick about like this and the woman comes a big mastodon, boom, 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 and they throw it and it kills it instantly and they go eat it baloney. Uh, they say, well, our, our, our early ancestors were hunters. Yeah, they were hunters, all right. Humans were so puny until the invention of gunpowder. <clears throat> humans were so puny and pathetic. We weren't the hunters. We were the hunted. And we would hide in the bushes, and we would watch the saber-toothed tigers and the hyenas eat that carcass, that elephant carcass. And then when they had had their fill, we would creep up and we would eat what was left over. And we were hunters and gatherers. And by the way, if we if, if we had depended on our prehistoric ancestors to hunt and to support the human race, the human race would have died out a million years ago. We would be an extinct, an extinct species. What saved the human race? Women and children. They went out and gathered nuts and berries while the men are out trying to kill this mastodon and getting trampled by it. <clears throat> Women are gathering and they would bring it back. And by the way, they didn't live in caves. They imitated their ape cousins. They lived up in tree. They lived at the bottom of the tree until some of the tiger showed up or something. And then they crawled up in the tree like their ape ancestors did. But they would live in a hollowed out part of the tree. They don't move into caves till lightning strikes and they learn how to control a little piece of the fire that started. Then they've got fire and they can evict all these big animals that would kill them out of the caves. So they know oh, that's pretty good. Well, they move up to the caves, okay? But women and children gathered these nuts and, and they would bring them back to the tree where the family was living or a group of families were living and they would break them up and process them. And in the process, and who knows how long it took, some of those seed fell into the ground. And one morning when they got up to go walk 12 miles to where there was a berry bushes that they had picked the day before, they looked and they saw a little berry bush growing. I don't know how long it took them to connect that. But eventually women and children invented agriculture. And human beings 
had a stable food supply. They didn't have to walk 12 miles. They could walk, eat it right there. And when that happened, the human race stopped wandering and they settled down and they built the first cities. You know what the word civilization comes from? Civitas, actually, kivitas, kivitas, from the cities. <laughs> and then they built walls around that. And then they began to, and you know where the, you know where the first civilization, where, which, which modern, if you said to your traveling, I want to go to where the first civilization took place, where the first cities were built, agriculture, I want to go see where all this stuff that we call civilization began. Where would you book your flight to? No. If, 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 I'm glad you said that. If you wanted to go see where the human race began, Africa. Or, as I like to call it, Africa. Africa. Where? So, there's like two rivers in between those two rivers. I'm pretty sure there were like two cities. Right. Like and where is that? The Tigris and the Euphrates River flow into the Persian Gulf. Which country is that today? But back to, I'm going to rejoin you later, but back to this. <clears throat> in the Great Rift Valley in Ethiopia, that's where the human race began. We are all Africa. If we traced our to back to our first, it'd be the Great Rift Valley. So anyway, the back to those two rivers. Uh, they were somewhere like Saudi Arabia. Pretty close. They were in Iraq. So we're civilized. First cities, but well, yeah. Actually, the first agriculture began in Turkey. That's where the Tigris and the Euphrates originate, and they flow down to Iraq. And, and uh, they... Uh, empty into the Persian Gulf. And the very first cities were built there. The very first religions were created there. The writing was created there. The very first alphabet was created there. We know we tend to look at Iraq as, oh, it's just some scorched desert backwater place. Oh, you know, what's important about it? Everything. I've got a little book at home <coughs> that ought to be required reading. It's called Everything Began at Sumer. And that's true because one of the 50 cities that eventually, maybe more than that, we're in the Tigris, and it was called, the Greeks later called it Mesopotamia. That means the land between two rivers. Um, but everything, one of those 50 or 60 cities was a place called Sumer. And you can argue that everything we have today began at the first roads, the first highways, the first babysitters. And by the way, they wrote it all down. This isn't guesswork. They wrote it on clay tablets. They scooped it out of the river and smoothed it out. And then they had a little stylus like you used in art class. And they wrote it out. They had their own language. The first written language in the world was called cuneiform. And then they would, when they filled up a tablet, they'd put it in the oven and bake it. And that's why you can go to the British Museum and see it. And a lot of other places and see it. They're still they're just digging out tons of the stuff. They wrote it down. We know how much they paid babysitters. It's equivalent to about 25 cents an hour today. That was 10,000 years ago. Well, 8,000 years ago. Everything began there. But what began everything? Agriculture. When humans no longer had to wander over the earth to secure a living. And by the way, who created agriculture? Women. Women. We talk about our founding fathers. Well, that's a pretty big deal. What about our founding mothers? You think that's appropriate? I do. You started the whole thing. You know, I don't want the bell to ring and me have to run out and catch a jackrabbit to eat. You know, I'm glad I can go to the Sonic. Yeah, thank you, ladies. We appreciate that. By the way, can we live without agriculture today? Well, it'd be sort of difficult, but no, we can't. Can we live without a computer today? Sure can. Can we live without a phone today? Sure can. I did that for most of my life, lived without those two things. And I thought I was pretty happy. Boy, you know, I didn't know what was coming. Facebook. Now I'm really happy. <laughs> Can we live without food? No. And what is our source of food to this very day? Agriculture. It was 10,000 years old and women created that. So when we, that's a long explanation. See, I used to teach ancient history and I really enjoyed it. I would teach it again if students would take it. It's a shame to me that they don't know anything about ancient history. But anyway, that's another topic for another day. Anyway, uh, if you go to Seneca, Missouri, you ought to know who that's named after. A great Roman philosopher named Seneca, maybe the most brilliant man that we are on and on about Socrates. 
we don't even know what Socrates really said. We know what his students said he said, but I'd hate for 30 years from now, somebody to come up to you and say, well, what did Thompson say? Like they did to Aristotle and Plato. Well, what did your great teacher Socrates, well, it was about 30 years ago, but here's, so I can't tell. But Seneca, he actually wrote, you know, Socrates was illiterate. You know, he couldn't read and write. But I think you ought to know who Seneca is. How many of you ever heard of Seneca before this morning? I feel like I have. I'm not talking about Seneca, Missouri. I'm talking about the Roman philosopher. I feel like I have. Well, I feel like that's a good thing. That's some progress. You ought to all know that. But anyway, that's not new. Anyway, back to this. <coughs> I, I get rest, but I like teaching ancient history. <coughs> the Romans and the Greeks and the uh, Sumerians and Babylonians, and Persians. Anyway. I've taken students to Greece and stood at Thermopylae, you know, and I tell them when we're at Thermopylae, I said, there's a direct line from Thermopylae to the beaches in Omaha to Gettysburg when you trace the history of liberty. And by the way, liberty that we have had to be invented just like that light, well, I don't think that thing, we're going to light bulb up there. It had to be invented. And just like that light bulb could be taken down and smashed to pieces and taken away, so can liberty. If most Americans understood that, we might have a better country. That, that's, you know, we ought to constantly be, you know, this is a great country, but we ought to be searching for ways to make it better. And that would make it better. But to understand how to uh, uh, preserve something, you have to know the origins of it, where it came from. Anyway, I digress. Anyway, he said in this, we need to go back to a simpler, we need to go back to the way America was before uh, the Civil War. Uh, he said civilization could not survive without the farmers and without agriculture. And then he reached, write this word down, this may be or it may not be, but then he reached the peroration. An oration is a speech. A peroration is the high point, or sometimes you hear it called the climax of the speech. The peroration. This is William Jennings Bryan. And by the time he reached the the end of his speech, the climax, the conclusion, whatever you want to call it. I think peroration is good. Everybody in that audience, you couldn't hear people breathe. He literally had swept that audience away. The arguments had stopped. People were standing in chairs with their hands cupped over both ears like that so they wouldn't miss one word. And this is his peroration. This is how he ended his speech. And I want you to read along silently as I read it aloud and make various comments. He said, you come to us and you tell us that the great cities of America are in favor of the gold standard. Burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will come back as if by magic. But destroy our farms and grass will grow in the streets of every city in this country. Every Destroy our farms. Destroy the farmer." Uh, like the monopolies and the trust are doing in this country, and every city in this country will become a ghost town. Having behind us the producing masses, the workers of this nation and the world, supported by workers everywhere, we will answer your demand for a gold standard by saying, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor, the brow of labor. You shall not press down upon, upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. And when he fit, by the time he had finished, he had lowered his head and he had spread his arms out like this. And of course, that very much reminded people of what? Jesus. The, the crucifixion of Christ. And for 60 solid seconds, nobody moved. It was almost like they were trying to absorb what they had heard. And then the place just get this down and exploded. They threw chairs in the air. They danced in the aisles. People stood with tears coming down their face. And they nominated William Jennings Bryan as their presidential candidate in 1896. This is the speech that won a presidential nomination. And it's not quite that simple, but it's pretty darn close. And by the way, I want you to write this last line down. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind 
on a cross of gold, a cross of gold speech. And William Jennings Bryan became the Democrat nominee for president. He was barely old enough, like I say. He was 36, and the constitutional requirement is 35. Okay, well, so that's the Democrats. We're in the election of 1896. That's the Democrats. The Republicans, get this down, have been watching all of this. The, Re the Republicans have been watching all of this, and the Republicans sensed the Republicans sensed we're going to win this election. We're going to win. The Democrats caused this depression, which the Democrats didn't. But anyway, the Democrats caused this depression. And because of that, we're going to win. We can't lose. And so the Republicans are going to run a campaign. Get this down. The Republicans are going to run a campaign that says, we told you so. Back in 1892, we told you if you elected a Republican, a Democrat, excuse me. We told you if you elected a Democrat that the country would go to hell in a handbasket. Well, you elected a Democrat in 1892, and now it's 1896, and the country has gone to hell in a handbasket. Half the country has nothing to eat, they said. And so they said it's time to go back to what worked. Get this down. You need to elect a Republican because if you elect a Republican, we will go back to the gold standard, or we will maintain, they have never left the gold standard, we will maintain the gold standard and high tariffs. We'll keep these foreign goods out. And as long as the dollar is strong, and as long as the American people buy American, everything will be okay. And they nominated, get this down, for president. We're talking about the Republicans now. The last Civil War general or Civil War veteran, he happened to be a general, I think. He was from Ohio. The last, you know, most of our presidents have come from either Virginia or Ohio. But anyway, the last Civil War veteran to serve as president, William McKinley. William McKinley is nominated by the Republicans, and he's going to win. When we come back tomorrow, I will tell you how. I need to turn this off.